Uh, recently, my daughter turned 24 years old, and she is, as we would say, of marrying age. And right now, I, she's dating. She doesn't tell us much. But I expect at some point in the future, and not any times too soon, I hope, that she's going to call home and say that she's met a special guy and that they're going to get married. In our culture, we generally leave the courtship and the dating and the choice of a spouse to the couple who are getting married. I will let my daughter make her own decision. But that indeed is not the practice everywhere. In some cultures, in the past, and even today, the custom of arranged marriages is widely practiced. And me as a father with a daughter, I will say that an arranged marriage, it's got a special appeal to me. An arranged marriage is one in which someone other than the couple getting married makes the selection of the persons to be wed. I want to be clear that I'm not talking about a forced marriage here. No, because those are widely condemned. I'm talking about when a third party, usually parents or another family member, makes the choice for who their child is going to marry. And sometimes the parents will conspire with the other parents to pair up their children. Royal families are especially prone to doing this. Now, there are definitely some drawbacks to this custom. The principal one being that the ones being married have little to no say in the matter. And sometimes a marriage is arranged for financial reasons and not compatibility. Again, royal families are good at doing that. But there are, in my opinion, some significant advantages of these arranged marriages. And as a father of a daughter, I can think of several. And the greatest one of these is that my wife and I have far more experience in relationships and are far better equipped than our young daughter to choose a spouse. We are less likely to be driven by emotion and love and more likely to consider and weigh the issues such as compatibility. We would also probably look at the other parents to determine if these are folks that we would want to spend any time with. Marriage is far too important to be left to love, isn't it? And a parent, a parent can bring their wisdom, experience, maturity, and a level head to this decision and make, I'm sure, a far better choice than the child. Having said that, I would never, wink, wink, uh, intervene in my child's choice of a spouse. But it is done around the world. And as I read up on arranged marriages, I discovered another benefit of these unions that I really had not considered before. And that is, oddly enough, low expectations. When we enter into a marriage with our dream man or dream woman, we're going to be disappointed at some time because no one can stand up to our expectations. No one can match the image that we've built up in our head. But when two young people are united in an arranged marriage, it's likely they haven't dated. It's possible that they don't even know each other. So their expectations for this relationship are going to be quite low. And the assumption that we find in arranged marriages is that although they do not love each other when they meet, that over time they will grow to love one another. And so the marriage is always on an upward trajectory. Our reading today comes to us from the book of Genesis. We've been following stories in this book now for several weeks, and as you'll recall, God called Abraham and his wife Sarah and sent them to another land where God promised to give the couple descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And as we've discussed several times now, the flaw in this plan is that Abraham and Sarah are getting on in years and they had never had any children of their own, 
So God was going to need to get to work if this couple were expected to have any descendants. So the couple heeded God's call. They left their home. They traveled south into the land of Canaan and settled there. And in time, Sarah did become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son, and they named him Isaac. By now, Abraham had grown quite old. His wife, Sarah, has already died, and his son, Isaac, is 40 years old and in need of a wife. Because with Ishmael gone, the other son, if Isaac doesn't have any descendants, then that promise of descendants ends there. So as a parent, it is Abraham's responsibility to find his son a spouse. But Abraham is far along in years, and he probably doesn't have the energy to undertake this task. So he delegates his duty to a servant, a very trusted servant, a man who is never named. Abraham makes this servant swear to him that he will go out and he will find a wife for Isaac. And this wife, under no circumstances, is to be a Canaanite. That is the people who live in the land where Abraham resides because they worship other gods. The servant is instead to return to the land of Abraham's people and find a wife there for Isaac, preferably from Abraham's family. Furthermore, Isaac himself is not to go to that land, but he is to remain always in Canaan because this is the land that God has given them. So, with all of these requirements, the servant sets off for the land of Abraham's ancestors. And he doesn't go empty-handed. He takes ten camels and all matter of special gifts, including clothing and gold jewelry. And when he arrives at the city of Abraham's ancestors, he locates the well outside the city gates, and he parks his camels there. And having arrived at his destination, the servant is not quite sure what to do now. How does he find a suitable young woman here? How does he find the right one? Does he run an ad on Facebook? Does he go around nailing posters to utility poles? Of course not. Instead, he prays. And he prays these words. O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, Please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. I am standing here by the spring of water and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. That is the prayer of this servant, a very specific prayer calling upon God for God's help. And we are told that even before he finishes this prayer, a young woman named Rebecca walks down to the well. Turns out that she is kin to Abraham, and she's carrying a water jar on her shoulder. And as she gathers water from the spring, the servant of Abraham runs to her and asks for just a sip of water from her jar. And she offers it to him. She lets him drink, and then she offers also to water his camels. And this was no small feat. As I said, a camel can drink gallons of water, and there were ten of them. But Rebekah continued to fill the trough until the camels had had their fill. The servant watched in amazement, and then he offered her gold and jewelry and asked what family she was part of. She told him and then invited him to her father's house to spend the night. And at the home with the family, the servant explains why he's there and how God had led him to find Rebekah. And there's a lot of discussion back and forth and negotiating with the family. But in the end, her father offers his daughter to return to Isaac. 
He was no doubt swayed by all the gold and the camels and the gifts that the servant offered his family. He was swayed by the knowledge that her husband would inherit a great wealth. But he was also swayed by the call of God. And nonetheless, even though all this negotiation has been made, they do give Rebecca the choice whether or not she wants to go. They leave it up to her. She agrees, and she says, yes, she will go. And so she and Abraham's men set out and return to Canaan. And as they approach Isaac's home, he is there out walking in his field, and he can see these camels on the horizon. And at the same time, Rebecca on a camel spots Isaac in the field and asks the servant, who's that man over there? And he tells her. And the servant provides Isaac a report of his trip. He tells what has happened. And then Isaac takes Rebecca into the tent where his mother had lived and presumably where they would live. And they are married, and we are told that Isaac indeed loved his wife. And in addition, having Rebekah with him proved to be a comfort to Isaac after losing his mother. So in this series, we have examined the stories of Abraham and Sarah and, of course, Ishmael and Isaac. And after we've looked at the horrors inflicted upon Ishmael and Isaac, this story is a welcome balm to our souls. It is a revealing love story, or at least the beginning of a love story. And it is also a reminder that God should be with us in our relationships. God should be in our marriages. God should be in our friendships, in our business relationships and even most especially in our church relationships. And the only way to bring God into these relationships is through prayer. In this rather convoluted story of Abraham sending his servant to the town of his ancestors to find a wife for his son, there are too many places where this story could go off the rails. And we can feel the tension of the servant as he's burdened with this great responsibility, but the story doesn't go off the rails, does it? Because God's hand is plain to see. God is guiding each person to where they need to be. Abraham, before he left, Abraham told the servant that God would send an angel ahead of him to help him in his task. Now, we don't meet this angel, but it is clear that the angel is there moving people where they need to be. And the result of this story is that Isaac takes Rebekah as his wife, and she becomes the future matriarch of what would be a great clan. They will have children, two children, Jacob and Esau. Esau will become the progenitor of the people known as the Edomites, and Jacob will change his name to Israel, and he will have 13 children. God's promise of a nation of descendants will come to fruition. The promise made two generations before to Abraham and Sarah. It continues. In this wonderful story, we see that our God is not above the ordinary life events of each of us. God is with us in our relationships with one another. And this story, this story is about many things. It's about traveling and hospitality, about meeting strangers who become family, about taking risks and leaving home in order to find a new home. It's a story that testifies to the power of love that comforts and that heals grief. But most of all, it's a story of faith journeys with paths that cross providentially. The servant's witness emboldens us to move out into our future's confidence that God's angel leads us on our way. We may not see that angel, but that angel 
is there. Finally, in closing, I will admit that while I might be a pretty good matchmaker for my daughter, I've decided that God would be far better. And so I promise to leave this matter into God's hands and pray. And we should all seek to include God in all of our relationships. And we should pray to God to guide us in all that we do. Amen.